Okay, I've started recording the session. So welcome to our CIRA Connects event with the Scottish Attainment Challenge project. As I said, the session is being recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, please turn off your camera. And um, please make sure your microphones are on mute. And I'm going to now hand over to the Attainment Challenge project team that will be presenting the session today. So please enjoy the session and looking forward to some good discussion. Okay, thanks very much, um, Nicola. It's Dil Coyle here, and I'm chairing the session this afternoon, the Connect session. And um, really, really looking forward to sharing um, two of the universities, the University of the Highlands and Ireland and um, the University of Edinburgh, um, want to share some of the work that they've been they've been doing. And really, what binds the two um, initiatives together is that it is around reframing schooling in and of the world and um, it's about providing those alternative perspectives on the government's attainment challenge for socially just and meaningful learner and life experiences and we're really looking forward to sharing with you um, the two initiatives. Um, we're going to start with the University of Edinburgh which is um, looking at reconceptualising attainment as achievement in response to the um, Scottish Government's Attainment Challenge, which is what the whole of the uh, universities were involved in, from very different perspectives. And that will be looking at reconceptualising attainment as achievement through co-design of shared learning spaces about promoting pupil agency, ownership and well-being. And then we're going to pass to Mark, um, who will be looking at reframing schooling in and around the pandemic, of course, and its potential to contribute to the diversity and sustainability of rural communities. Um, and very much looking at the uh, how that's um, contributed to the digital age, but also looking at two very hidden aspects of, um, of uh, rural schooling. So I think uh, without any more uh, ado, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand over to uh, Ramon and Jonathan who will be presenting from the University of uh, Edinburgh. So I'm just going to stop sharing now and hand over to them. Please uh, make full use of the chat. Um, I shall be monitoring the, the chat. Thanks, Do. Uh, I'm Jonathan Hancock. I'm a research associate at the University of Edinburgh. And um, along with my colleague, Ramon al um, we're going to be uh, presenting on our project today, which is reconceptualizing uh, attainment as achievement through co-design of shared learning spaces. So just a brief uh, introduction. Uh, the focus of our project is on repositioning the attainment challenge through promoting alternative ways of designing and sharing learning and working uh, with student teachers and our partnership schools. Um, we're looking at developing understandings of spatial literacies in order to promote relational pedagogies that are place-based and place responsive. And also involving children as designers of their own learning spaces reformulating the idea of attainment as achievement um, and looking at if children are given the chance to participate in decision making um, about uh, important matters in their lives, how that can help uh, promote achievement and well-being. So there's two uh, key strands to our project. The first is the shared learning space design strand, which we're going to talk about today. There's also a shared garden spaces strand, which is led by our colleague uh, Lara Colucci Gray. Um, and she will be um, presenting on that at a later CIRA Connect webinar. So uh, at this stage, I'd like to hand over to Ramon, who's going to talk a bit about the theory and um, theoretical underpinning of the project. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Dol. Um, yeah, so um, I just want to kind of go into why we decided to reconceptualize attainment as achievement. What we could see from the gathering and analyzing the baseline data and from the conversations that we had as a team as a result of that was that viewing success through the lens of attainment arguably devalues diverse learner pathways of achievement. In fact, one's inability to attain according to the standard criteria can drastically diminish a learner's self-esteem and creating, creating further barriers to learning. So what we wanted to do is recognize and celebrate the achievements of learners, all learners, because we know that 
that leads to an increase in, in self-esteem and engagement. Um, raising self-esteem involves pupils taking ownership of their learning and by encouraging them to both recognize and define success, that leads to an increase in self-identity, um, a positive self-identity, should I say. And so through this approach, learners shift from being passive learners to knowledge consumers and finally to knowledge creators. And one, as one teacher aptly put it, getting young people to lead learning for each other is really the pinnacle of learning. Can, I go, can you go to the next slide, please, Jonathan? So yeah, going into the theoretical independent. Now we've worked in um, shared learning spaces for a number of years now. And we know that what we enable within those shared learning spaces, or at least what we try to do, is deconstruct the power dynamic and to enable a more co-constructed approach to learning and teaching. That's what we try to enforce, uh, foster. And that's what we ne negotiate with the participants. These spaces, these shared spaces, engender a sense of value and genuine connectivity between the participants. <clears throat> Within the shared learning spaces, we support our student teachers and pupils to develop spatial literacies that really enable them to understand the significance of the physical, of the cognitive and the social, and how they're mutually like, independent, interdependent. Sorry. Effectively, what we're trying to do, what we're talking about, and when we're trying to incorporate is learning ecologies which take into account the myriad of people and places and go beyond that narrow view of schools and educational institutions. It's about learning to read the space and considering it as a third teacher. Next slide, please. So just to set the scene a little bit, our shared learning spaces research has involved a wide range of schools, quite a number of schools and right across the board from mainstream provision to specialist schools. But for the purposes of the Scottish Attainment Challenge project, we worked with one primary school and one secondary school that are both situated in areas of multiple deprivation. And we worked with our student teachers from the PGD course and the transformative learning and teaching course. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, we took a participatory action research approach, we've, which we felt was most appropriate for this study, because it values the participant as an e equal contributor. They help define the parameters, they help determine the process of the research and also the development. And we collectively analyzed the outcomes of that. So we looked at two questions. The first one was, how do we develop these spatial literacies by looking at that partnership between the student teachers and the pupils and how does that lens of um, spatial literacies enable achievement and the second one was to look at how by developing these spatial literacies how we might contribute how we might create inclusive spaces next slide please so the first step we took and um, we've not actually mentioned it on the slide here was the um to go through a Delphi process with both the teachers in the school and the pupils. And what that process enabled us to do is develop a mutual understanding of what spatial literacies are. Um, we went on to basically create a platform in the shared learning space where pupils from the secondary school could design and deliver learning. They could demonstrate to the student teachers the ways that they like to learn. The second part of those mini lessons was actually for the student teachers, for the pupils to then challenge the student teachers to basically deliver lessons that reflected the ways that the pupils like to learn. And um, that resulted in a number of things. Can you go to the next slide, please? So um, through this visibility and ownership and also accountability, which actually um, Shulman refers to in his signature pedagogies, this pupils started to engage, like there was deep engagement from the pupils. Um, they started to under understand the teacher's perspective and they wanted more opportunities to lead learning and ultimately to start taking risks, which is again, something that Shulman refers to. And we'd do done this prior to looking at Shulman's signature pedagogies. So it was interesting that we had those, th those ways of thinking that was very similar. Um, the, peop the people teaching were also learning. So, the roles were reversed, uh, the roles were shifted and continually negotiated. Um, so that was also in line with Shulman's signature pedagogies and um, pedagogies of uncertainty. Now the further thing was that the students gained through this process a deeper understanding of the pupils' context. 
And that's what we're ultimately trying to do. And that really responded to what the secondary um, head, uh, deputy head teacher spoke about, that it's embedding that understanding and developing that empathy within our student teachers about the students, uh, about the pupils' context. So um, they could see through the shared learning spaces how to increase pupil agency, ownership and achievement. Next slide, please. And so we had lots of learning conversations and we can, we're still doing that with the teachers, um, learning conversations between the um, teachers and pupils, between the students, teachers and pupils and lot, lots of it. But what they've enabled um, it's for learners and teachers to unpick and address some of the imbalances that exist within the traditional learning context about who, who owns learning, who's responsible for learning, who designs learning. And then we shifted on to the, um, the design of learning spaces. And that became kind of pro uh, prominent for us because with COVID hitting, basically the impact of that gave us all a sense of space, a deeper understanding um, and sense of space. So our next steps were to look at the learning spaces themselves and how these might be co-designed with the learners. Thank you. Thanks, Ramon. So um, as Ramon just said, we kind of shifted to look at the design of learning spaces and the design of learning that takes place within them. And at the, the school to the primary school, pupils really took the lead in the design of their own learning environments. Um, so we've been collaborating with interior designers at City of Edinburgh Council and with Architecture and Design Scotland to develop a shared learning space design toolkit. And this draws on um, David Thornburg's campfires in cyberspace and has a set of symbols, including uh, learning typologies, which are the different types of learning that take place in these spaces. So, for example, you have uh, the cave, which represents uh, independent or reflective learning, uh, the watering hole, which is collaborative learning, and journey to the mountaintop, which is celebrating achievement through learning. Um, and a lot of our pilot, a lot of our schools are piloting this this toolkit, but in this school in particular, it was used for things like lesson planning, uh, linking to um, outcomes uh, and experiences. Um, but also um, it was used by pupils to lead on the design of their own learning spaces. And this led to a greater um, sense of ownership and achievement um, and engagement as well. So um, pupils, um, one class in particular, uh, designed a wall in one of the classrooms. Um, and it wasn't just about bringing in new furniture and expensive things like that. It was about using the resources that were available in the school to enhance the learning space. Um, the toolkit was also used uh, to promote learning conversations between pupils and teachers. They developed the common language around the symbols to discuss learning. Um, and it also facilitated the, the design and creation and adaptation of truly inclusive learning environments. So a lot of the conversations that pupils had uh, amongst themselves was around how is this space accessible for all pupils in this school, for all learners. And the school felt that that had transformed the school culture. So bringing this back to uh, initial teacher education, uh, we've been engaging with student teachers throughout the project um, and um, looking to embed spatial and uh, relational approaches in ITE. Um, we had organized an in-person uh, workshop with student teachers in May 2020, which um, unfortunately had to move online as a result of the COVID pandemic. Um, but we used the, work, uh, the workshop to engage with student teachers on these concepts around spatial literacies and learning space design and also raising awareness of high leverage practices that the students could use to develop inclusive learning spaces in their schools. Um, this past month, we just uh, held another workshop with our MSc Transformative Learning and Teaching students, where they looked um, at the toolkit in particular and how they could use the toolkit in practice to promote uh, achievement um, when they're in schools working with pupils. And we've also been working with newly qualified teachers. Some of the students that attended the first workshop last year, we've continued to work with them as they've gone into schools as NQTs. 
Um, one NQT has based um, his professional inquiry around uh, learning space design with pupils and looking at how that promotes um, achievement and pupil voice. So the key messages and, and next steps, uh, we think it's absolutely crucial that uh, student teachers are able to develop understandings of spatial literacies and shared design of learning um, and are able to conceptualize spaces dynamic and integral to the quality of learning. And we're looking to further embed these principles in ITE through the development of a learning design hub in the School of Education. Um, which can be used by teams of hybrid pioneers. So that would be student teachers, teachers and pupils. Uh, and they can use this hub, this space to explore with learning, uh, explore learning space design and the impact the space has on learning. And we're also looking to expand and extend the use of the toolkit in schools across the country and also looking to link internationally as well. So we're part of a large scale uh, scoping study that is led by the University of Melbourne that's looking at the impact of space on learning in a number of different countries. So thanks very much. I hope uh, you found that interesting, the overview of uh, our project. If anyone has any questions or comments, we'd be happy to uh, answer them now or in the general discussion. Thanks very much. Okay, um, so there's a question about um, the kind of spaces that were designed. Um, does one of you want to look at the typologies or? I mean, it's important to say as well that these aren't only in new builds, these are, and it's got, in some ways, it's got less to do with the physical environment, but it's, it's taking what you've got and turning it into. Um, so, I don't know whether one of you would just wants to answer that question before we hand over to Mark. Jonathan, why did we do it between us? So, um, yeah, as Doyle said, they're not always um, just, you know, new designs. They're done on a limited budget on many occasions. But, for example, in the primary school, we have areas that um, demonstrate the typologies, the learning type typologies, which are the cave, the watering hole, the campfire, the fields and the mountain top. Um, and they can, I, I don't know if you want to give an actual uh, image of that, Jonathan, I don't know if it's easy to kind of show that on, on screen or not. Um, but you know, you might have like little huts, but it's, it's or pizza tables that are movable. So they're quite agile spaces. They might have plants in the center of of tables, but they're all very unique. That's the thing to say, because they're designed by the pupils. Um, and so it's, it's really up to them how they how they want to design those spaces. Um, in one of the schools, they've developed a, a room that's called the tree house. And that's um, very much using biophilic design, incorporating that into the space to make it calm. Uh, we could we could talk for a long time about that, I have to say. OK, perhaps we can pick up on those um, on those later. Um, so hopefully that gives you, um, you know, some kind of, um, yeah, uh, insight into what that is. So um, on something uh, related, but um, in terms of reframing schooling, I'd like now to pass over to Mark. Um, are you ready to share your screen, Mark? Hi, Do. Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, for being here this afternoon to share this time with us. So. Um, my focus today is still on reframing schooling, um, but I, I'm looking at, at sort of a different level um, with a different focus. So I'm inviting you to reimagine the rural um, and, and how this wider reimagining might help to close the poverty related attainment gap. And this is um, really a conceptual discussion that's taken place with a number of the newly qualified teachers who participated in our projects. So I'll just uh, share that with you. So there are three particular areas that um, we want you to try and reimagine. Maybe you can join me on that journey today of reimagining these things too as I go through the material. But first of all, um, I want us to sort of reflect on perceptions that exist of rural education in Scotland uh, and try to um, dig beneath the, the surface of those to, to understand the diversity that really does exist there. Um, the other thing um, in terms of sort of conceptual ideas, particularly 
is what exactly poverty is in rural Scotland or in terms of the Scottish index of multiple deprivation, um, the deprivation at that sort of level of, um, you know, the most deprived 20% of the population. And in addition to that, reflecting on dialogue about achievement in rural areas. So um, we just heard um, from Jonathan Ramon about that sort of shift in phraseology from attainment to achievement and, and how place is a key to achieving that. Well, or similarly within the the rural context, um, there are narratives that exist or, or themes, dialogues regarding what is um, achievement in the wider sense. And I think if we move from attainment in terms of the statistics to concepts of achievement, there's some really interesting things for us to reflect on in society as we find it now, particularly on the back of the pandemic. So our research focused on some um, particular questions that really invited this conceptual discussion. So um, the NQTs were looking at their own use of evidence. So they're thinking about how they're identifying pupils in terms of need um, for the purposes of closing the attainment gap. And, and it was with a focus within the project of the, the two deciles that are the most deprived and across the responsibility of all curricular areas of literacy, numeracy and health and wellbeing. And the way those discussions went was such that the, the two key conceptual themes that cropped up were rural attainment and poverty in rural areas. Um, the structure of this has been um, quite long term over three years. Those of you who are familiar with the Scottish Attainment Challenge Project will, will know that. Um, so it did start off three years ago as a sort of face-to-face -face, um, event as much as possible, but with some online engagements um, up to March of last year or so, there was that opportunity to engage in face-to-face -to -face too. And since then it's taken an online form but we've had over 40 newly qualified teachers taking part and across the partner authorities that constitute for us the Highlands and Islands region uh, of the University of the Highlands and Islands. So that includes then Highland Council, Murray, Argyll and Butte and the, the island councils of the Western Isles, Shetland and Orkney. Uh, and at some point or other participants from each of those authorities has taken part. Um, in terms of the methods, I think the key things I'll sort of draw out from this is just that the discussions were phrased to empower the newly qualified teachers as much as possible. So they varied from semi-structured to unstructured in approach. And um, in terms of where the themes that I'm talking about today came in, it was regarding um, their ideas as to what was meant by these things. So we started off even discussing what was meant by rurality in itself, and it fed into the sort of concepts that I'm going to talk about today. Um, the names of people who I'm going to talk about here are obviously being changed for the purposes of their anonymity. And, and through a narrative analysis, we picked on the key themes and a couple of extracts have been brought into this here that, that reflect those themes that cropped up. So if we started with the concept of attainment in rural areas, um, one of the first things that gives us a starting point is when the OECD wrote about Scotland in 2015 and pointed out to the exceptional nature of education, rural education in Scotland. Um, so it was the, the one country that they could point to where they could say rural education was outperforming urban education. So in a sense that kind of sets for us an expectation or standard through which we might perceive rural education as at that level of meta discourse. Um, this sort of label has been attributed to rural education in Scotland. And there is evidence to support it in the statistics. We can look to the review of attainment against expected curriculum for excellence levels for the year 1819, for example. And we can see that if we look at accessible rural areas, schools in those outperform any other area category. So um, there's definitely stuff to support that perspective. But at the same time, any perception that we may have that rural education overall is uh, advantageous or beneficial will overlook the complexities of the need that we'll see today is found in rural areas. Um, if your screen is on small mode for my slides, you won't have a chance of seeing this, but I'll kind of discuss very briefly what it's showing. So if you looked at the if you see there are chunks of four sort of bars here and um, the second one up from the bottom is accessible rural areas and uh, the left hand side bars represent literacy and the right hand side bars numeracy and in all aspects so at each stage and it's charted at p1 p4 p7 and s3 at each stage accessible rural areas is outperforming or at least equal to any other category of area so that's including large urban areas, other urban areas, accessible small towns, remote small towns and remote rural areas as well. So that supports the narrative that the OECD has put forward. But actually, if we look at the two 
sets of bars either side of that one, so the bottom one and the third one up, they're actually smaller than all the other ones. And what they represent actually is our remote and remote rural areas. So remote small towns and remote rural areas. And actually those are in terms of attainment as it's measured against the curriculum for excellence levels, underperforming against every other category of area. So if we go with the narrative that um, in Scotland, rural education is kind of fine because um, it's the one that's outperforming urban, it completely masks this um, reality of the remote rural. Um, so it's really key for us to be aware of that difference. And uh, it's not just in terms of the curriculum for excellence levels, we see that situation, it kind of filters through to other aspects of society too. So the, the government wrote in 2015 about um, college and higher education levels and spotted that if you're in an accessible rural area, then uh, your educational level is likely to be the same as the rest of Scotland. However, in those remote rural areas again, it was likely to be lower. So you, you were less likely to have, for example, a degree level qualification. So there's some sort of translation there between what was happening at school level and what's happening in higher education. And this feeds us, I think, really neatly into Corbett and Force's um, point to do with rural education and rural areas. And that's the, a common attribute of you know, what education's about is out migration. It's the idea that you're going to sort of flee from the rural to seek opportunities in the world and kind of advance yourself and find opportunity. So uh, achievement in that sort of sense is seen as moving away from the place. And this is where we get into the terminology of the leaving discourse, as it's sometimes called, uh, or by other people, the escape narrative. So, um, you know, if we're going to say, what's that transition from attainment to achievement in the rural context, it seems to be moving away. And uh, one of the newly qualified teachers kind of harnessed that perspective in a sense, because um, she, she said this, when I got my place at university, my family saw it as a real achievement. At that stage, I was ready to move away. I want to use the next few years as a chance to work in different parts of Scotland. I ticked the box, I was willing to go anywhere. So you, you can see her kind of flexibility and almost excitement to be able to go and explore the country. And uh, the family seemed to see, you know, that movement to university is, you know, a good sign of achievement for her. So the other concept that we've explored is the idea of poverty in rural areas or, or deprivation. And I think as a starting point, we could say that actually even the identification of the original nine attainment challenge authorities said something about the idea that poverty is mainly an urban, an urban phenomenon. Um, so so that, that dialogue is already out there. And, and there's a legitimate basis for it. I mean, if we do look at things, for example, such as the two most deprived deciles in the Scottish index of multiple deprivation, we find within it that the central belt has a swathe of, um, you know, of, of deprivation marked. And you can sort of see that here. I've tried to do a, a cut of a map of the north of mainland Scotland and uh, covering most of the landmass of the highlands and islands. And you can see the, the red dotted area across from Glasgow to Edinburgh, uh, which stands out a lot more than anything does north of it. Um, and you'd be doing very well to spot the red dots further north of that. Um, and this is the, each red dot representing areas that are within the most deprived 20%. But it's not the case that within the Highlands and Islands, um, the SIMD doesn't identify deprivation um, within um, more built up areas, such as in Murray, Elgin and Forest, um, in Argyll and Butte, Oban, Rothsey, Danoon, Helensburgh and Campbelltown, and then uh, within Highland itself, Wick, Ballantour, Invergordon, All Nest, Dingwall, Inverness and Fort William. Um, but there is a pattern amongst those that they tend to be those places with slightly larger concentrations of population. And if we look to the island communities, we find none registering at the level of uh, that sort of most deprived 20%. So Shetland, Orkney and the Western Isles miss out in that measure. Um, so when we look at the map of Orkney, we're not expecting to find any red dots there, and uh, indeed we don't. Um, but it's worth us reflecting on it as an example. Um, and if we, we look at a report that the Health and Care Integration Joint Board produced just a couple of years ago in Orkney, they flagged up the positives of the place that justify the absence of those markers. 
um, saying how in you know national media reports it's been flagged up as one of the best places to live and grow up, you know, have a family, um, and and noting its affluence. But then at the same time, pointing out research that was commissioned by the Orkney Ch Children and Young People's Partnership one year earlier that showed that 14% of children in Orkney are in poverty. So uh, despite that perception of affluence, there's a sizable number of children uh, in circumstances that aren't being identified in those statistics. And I think even more importantly, which sort of explains the problem with this SIMD data, is that research also showed that three quarters of the families that were either income or employment deprived didn't live in areas that even within Orkney were perceived as being deprived. So there's this sort of complexity there between trying to connect poverty and place when actually, you know, poverty and deprivation affect individuals. So if we reflect on the SIMD data, um, if you're familiar with it, you'll know that it has seven key domains. So I mentioned just income and employment. There's also health, education and skills levels, housing, sort of access to amenities and resources and geographic access and crime statistics that feed into the overall ranking of each place. And uh, the government itself has acknowledged as recently as last year that there is a problem with this data for rural areas. They'll admit now that a rural area um, in terms of one unit of measure is much more likely to be larger geographically than urban ones because obviously the population is more dispersed. So to include you know, reasonable numbers of people, it's a, a larger landmass. And then the, the obvious consequence of that also acknowledged is that if you have a larger area like this, there's more likely to be diversity within it. Um, so the sort of diversity that we, you know, just uh, imagined in in Orkney, yeah, um, with that 75% that the deprived family is unlikely to be necessarily living in the deprived area against the urban concentrations that we tend to get of, you know, similar types of uh, housing and people's experience of deprivation. So. Uh, if we went back to that list of places within the Highlands and Islands that did come up in the 20% most deprived, of course, they're the more built up ones because that feeds into this idea. So as a consequence of it, we're left in the situation, certainly in terms of official data, that we have crypto poverty in rural areas, so hidden poverty. And I think uh, a really good example of this was given by somebody I call Shona here, who was on an, an island community and a newly qualified teacher. And, and she spoke of the circumstances of one of her pupils and was able to say this, that she was aware that the family was low income, the education levels were low, that they were having trouble with housing. The pupil themselves had health issues. Um, there was crime within the family. Um, they were having difficulties accessing school. If ever there was any problem catch the school bus, they couldn't get to school and the family didn't drive. Um, the school itself was quite remote. Uh, and they also pointed out the fact that the neighbors living around this family tended to have more modern, bigger houses. And this was quite an old, small cottage. And, and this newly qualified teacher saw this particular pupil as being in extreme deprivation. Their, their determination, their situation was that they were you know, very much suffering as a consequence of their circumstances. But of course, the area they're living in, for all the reasons I've just gone through, wouldn't come up in the most deprived quintile or 20 percent of the index of multiple deprivation. But even if we look at the language she used there, we can see that actually six of the seven domains are, are identified for this particular individual. The only one that's not explicitly stated is employment. But if the, the reasons for that low income in the family are employment related, we'd have all seven. So uh, in a sense, this pupils are epitomizing what the index is trying to show. Um, but you know, there's not that single dot on the, on the map. Um, for that island community. And then the, the third thing I want us to think about is some of the consequences of this, and particularly in relation to the leaving discourse. So if you remember, I mentioned earlier on Lorna, who said that uh, her family was really pleased with her achievements of getting a place at university, and she was ready to flee and go anywhere. Yeah, um, And that kind of mirrors the, the talk that goes on in the classroom. So Caitlin, a primary NQT, she uh, explained what they were doing to try and make, um, you know, parental involvement in the community and to build relationships with the community around the school. And she mentioned how they invite parents in to talk about their jobs. And uh, she, she said how that kind of highlights opportunities for the learners when they leave school and also builds obviously the community connections. Um, but, you know, there were the particular industries 
for that location for her fishing and farming and then the, the children talked about going into those industries that was kind of the expectation a lot of them mentioning a particular family relation that they might be going to work with and then caitlin tells us that you know it's the case that if people are looking for other careers that involves moving away now we've had obviously affecting this research and uh, our lives uh, since the pandemic and and this presents a really interesting conundrum for rural areas and I, and I think this is quite inspiring as to what it might mean for education so um, we've had this situation where you know, many people have had the opportunity to develop their digital skills the digital literacy and um, but at the same time we're aware of that in itself being something that can be inequitable so uh, whether people have access to technology a secure broadband connection um, that's an issue and across the UK as a whole uh, Burgess Gemma Burgess's research from Cambridge um, recently shown with the digital literacy index that 22 percent of the UK lack either the relevant level of skills or access to be able to engage in technology and there was some evidence of that through the the mention of um, the the student the NQTs in, in the research but at the same time as we've seen technology has given people the opportunity to work from rural areas without needing to move um, and there is a call back to place as well Debbie another NQT she said after school I was ready to move away from the highlands I was looking forward to the experience of city life after meeting my partner and wanting to settle down I decided to move back to an area like the one I grew up in I knew it'd be the right place for having a family of my own so sometimes there's a call back from place um, to where we started and then um, I think we can look at the example of initial teacher education as it's been able to be conducted in rural areas for you know a model to ask if this is possible for other careers and then to ask of the potentiality of that in terms of the sustainability of rural areas so there was a program the university of dundee offered and uh, this was called the rural learn to teach program it was part-time pgde where people were local authority employees keeping their jobs when they went on school placements they managed to keep their pay and they worked towards the pgd part-time remaining in their community uh, and you know we had this example here of kirsty saying she wouldn't have been able to become a teacher without a course like that they had a mortgage they were paying for that and there's no way she could afford to move away uh, and do a pgd elsewhere uh, and then one of our students at uhi um, now obviously an nqt and she said she was able to stay in an area because of the sort of provision that we have networked courses across the highlands and islands and she could stay close to home without leaving her community and obviously that homegrown talent then means there are graduates in the area still and teachers who are sensitive to the community's needs so i think one of the things we're left with is asking ourselves you know what can we do with learners in terms of developing digital literacy to facilitate a world where those career options are not just in teaching other professions as well are now able to operate remotely um so oh, we, yeah so we're nearly wrapping up that's now. it yeah so yeah. just overall i mean what I've, what I've asked you to reflect on then really is is these things um that we need to see rural education as uh, complex um, and a, a diverse place to realize that aspects of poverty are hidden and, and therefore it changes the dynamics as to um, how we engage with data um, and the opportunities that a digital, digitally literate new generation provides. So that's me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and so, uh, okay, so any um, uh, quick specific questions to Mark and then we'll open the floor um, for a general discussion looking at the uh, reframing, which was in two um, slightly different, but actually underneath it all quite that there's some messages there. Um, so anything uh, in particular to um, to Mark? You explained it really well, Mark, thank you. <laughs> um, it's very, very clear. Um, okay, so there's a lot to think about there, um, especially in, in terms of the SIMD areas and what that means um, in two quite different contexts. 
So I'd like to open the floor then now to um, anybody that'd like to ask a question. If not, I shall certainly uh, relay some of the interesting questions that have been posed in the chat. So um, are there any questions from anybody to, to start start with? Successfully managed to, to silence everybody. So I've got a question for Jonathan and Ramon, if you don't mind, which was to do with that shift they experienced between working in this project sort of in person to online. And I'm just wondering what they were observing, particularly in terms of the, the constitution of online connectedness in space, you know, because obviously they're still watching what's going on and, and involved in understanding spatiality from that sort of perspective. I'm, I'm just wondering if any of the real world stuff was emulated in the online space or if it had a very different nature of its own. Mm, that's a really interesting question, Mark. I think what I'd say initially is that um, it was very different. But as we started, as, as the student teachers and the pupils started to develop a spatial understanding, to develop that spatial fluency, we started to see how the learning typologies, when we described the campfire and the cave and the watering hole, how they started to um, apply in an online context. And so, um, but also just to note, we did continue our research into what learning environments are like at home with the secondary school pupils and the primary school pupils. And some of the primary school pupils started to kind of re reconfigure their spaces at home because they had that awareness they had that heightened awareness of you know space because covid made made it so for all of us so um that was a really interesting journey for them and also to look at the types of learning that were taking place because we have interesting data to say those pupils are a bit more kind of reserved actually really thrived in those environments the online environments whereas those who were very much um engaged in school and um enjoy that kind of social kind of collaborative type of learning um, missed out on those opportunities so there's a wealth of kind of data to explore just within that and and sorry on a final note just to say one of the teachers we interviewed who, who was delivering online learning in that context um, was saying that actually when the pupils came back she noticed a significant difference in terms of um, the ability to socialize within the first the first years to socialize and um, so that just really heightened the need for this understanding of the cognitive, the social and the physical and the importance of all those three combined. Thanks for your question. Hope you answered it. I hope I did. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> okay, so in the, um, in the chat, um, there was some, there was questions about responsive pedagogies. There was um, looking at, um, changes in the role of the class teacher um, and that's very particular but it's there's other things um concerning the, the kind of the, the poverty issues the hidden poverty issues and so on um you know please do feel free um does anybody want to take up um any of the uh, questions from the chat i noticed that Gillian, for example talked about the high high leverage um what um issues concerned with the, the student teachers and um you know working in both uh, initiatives we're working with students and the of that um, and one thing I will add is to say that um, one year down the line um, the one of the probationary teachers that we were working with had in fact first um, in his own words had his eyes opened when he came to our own workshop when he was a student himself and the same had happened in the secondary school as well so you know for, for us that gives us kind of hope that if we're investing in our student teachers, it might not always be visible because we don't always know what when, they, uh, when they, they go out. But actually, I don't think we should ever underestimate some of the influence. I think we might have lost Doe there. Um, an internet connection. 
Hi, Do. Sorry, we lost you there for a moment with the oh, internet connection. Yeah, it's it's okay. not particularly good. No, I, I was just I was just saying that we should never underestimate that our student teachers are change agents, and whilst we might not always have the hard data to prove it, nonetheless we come across this. And as I say, we fell upon um, the probationer. We had no idea, um, and it was a little while also before he actually told us. He said, that, you know, that this this had happened because he'd met special mistresses um, in his probation year. Um, I had a question though that I'd put in the chat that I'm quite happy to ask if you want. Yeah, please do. Um, it was just, I was really struck by both your your presentations and the, the questions you were raising around this idea of attainment and um, the poverty related attainment gap and what that actually means. And so I know it's a big question, but I think you did start to hint at it in your presentation. So what do you think the implications are of your research findings on the political focus on, on the attainment gap? Do you want to start with that, Mark? Yeah, I, I don't mind coming in. I mean, one of, one of the things that feeds through from the, this sort of problem in rural areas of them not coming up in the statistics is that that, that statistic, the SIMD 20% most deprived, you might think, in itself, well, there are other measures of deprivation. Why is that significant? It's you know, it's one resource we can turn to, and, and there are others available to us. And we could look at more localized statistics, or um, you know, there are plenty of other sources of data. But at the same time, it's the it is the data that feeds into the measuring of the attainment gap. You know, the, the calculation of attainment in terms of the attainment gap as to whether it's narrowing or closing is around the difference between the most deprived twenty percent and the least deprived twenty percent. So directly within this index. So the, the, the first political implication of that is actually those learners in deprivation in the island communities that don't have any appearance in those statistics at all, they're, they're um, literally brought into the mainstream, the centre ground, rather than uh, reflected. So in a sense, if we fix the statistic, there's nothing to guarantee their experience is fixed because they're not in that statistic. So that's one of the implications from what I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I think the research more broadly um, has, has been really useful just because for us it, it's created a, a space that didn't exist before and this links a little bit with David's question where he's asked about um, shared space to do with rural schools um, and opportunities for the building of social capital um, where there is sort of higher deprivation and stuff and uh, one of the things that our projects actually did it in using online space was created networks that didn't exist before. So in a sense, a community of practice developed across different rural contexts, some more urban than others, some would be accessible <coughs> rural. Um, so there's sort of the towns or even the city of Inverness. Um, others would be remote island schools that are really isolated. Um, but this gave them a place to come together. And also it emitted from it any sort of uh, you know, managerial hierarchy that might be met within a school or local authority context. Um, and I think that was quite empowering for the newly qualified teachers for them to share experience. And this is a platform through which they were able to share ideas to, to mutually support each other, because one of the problems often of remote rural schools is engaging in things like development of the staff and accessing resources and different ideas, you know, because there isn't one little, you know, one uh, academy in the area that everybody can drive to for their, their CPD or whatever, so or, or CLPL. So those are some of the implications I think about. And also, if we take up the political um, agenda that you're talking about, Nicola. Um, in terms of the attainment gap, we you know it's it's well rehearsed what um, the measurement of attainment, and where we were looking at was what what does it mean when we're valuing achievement and it's not a touchy feely you've done really well and pat on the back it's not that at all but it was actually around those power dynamics and enabling learners who would never ever under different circumstances have had a, that opportunity and also this this upskilling really of being able to um for example talk about their own learning the way that they like to learn to analyze that and then to share that with student teachers who you know themselves as as the uh, pupils in school knew too well that they were going to be the future teachers that could even be their teacher next year and they were challenging them and saying this is how we like to be taught 
and from the teachers who were working in the school we know that they were saying you know these learners have not had that kind of voice before and it was genuine because the student teachers were having to respond <clears throat> excuse me back and so that's just one very very small example um and it was very challenging because you know you may well say well this is how they want to be taught and it was it was just some very small things like how they did love using YouTube because they could go at their own pace, they could rewind the video, they could da 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 da. And it's all these very small things, but when it's coming from the learners themselves, it was a very powerful way of, of operating. So small examples, but very, very big messages, I think, in terms of um, politics and how we can actually look at the attainment, uh, sorry, the achievement gap in a, a very, very different way. Yeah, thanks, Do I, I got that sense of that, and it's so good to it's it's so good to hear that actually. And as you're saying, those small examples actually can make a big difference. So thank you, really interesting, and um, from you all, thanks. I'm just looking again at. Um, sorry, there was. I, I don't want to um, capture all the stuff about the learning spaces, but it's the concept of the space. Um, it's not the physical, well, it's how the physical space and the cognitive space and the social spaces all come together and it's enabling learners to understand that. And they do, um, not necessarily in those terms, but certainly um, in terms of um, uh, the understanding of learning. And if nothing else, I would say that actually analysing learning and different types of learning was so much easier with those little symbols um, to, to do that. So, um anything anything else generally um yeah we talked about correlations and so on yes hi hi may i interject so, thank you I, please I, do I, sorry thank you yeah I, that, that was absolutely fascinating both presentations thank you um i really enjoyed them but it got me thinking uh, about the whole attainment project and it was the first presentation that kind of dawned on me really and I don't know why it's taken me this long to, to dawn on me that it, it seems to me that when you have areas of low, low attainment and deprivation um, it's absolutely fine to go in and do some really innovative creative projects that's okay and I and I always wonder well two things I, I, I wonder lots of things but I, I wonder these things in relation to it um, is it, in a sense, an attempt to sort of um, middle class everybody and get everybody to that position where they don't need that kind of stuff anymore because they're quite happy to um, get their good grades? And, and I mean, I, I live in, in wonderful Dunblane with, a, you know, the fifth, fourth, fifth best high school in Scotland. Um, I won't say any more than that. Um, and I wonder whether that kind of thing and those kind of things would ever get anywhere near, you know, Bears Den, Newton Mains, Dunblane or anything like that, where we want to reconfigure and re-envisage the learning space, where we want to, heaven forfend, do some team teaching perhaps or anything like that. You know, I, I wonder whether what we're seeing is, is a, a sort of a, an attempt to simply say to those communities that are are failing because that's how they're presented in the in the narrative isn't it they're failing in some respect well you kind of throw them a bone and this is what you can do and this is and you can be all creative and innovative because well we, we want you to be more like them um i, I don't know I mean, am, am i being too cynical about this am i or am i i'm i don't know really i it just worries me somewhat not not the fact that we're trying to help people that never worries me but it worries me that maybe it's that kind of cynical edge to make to get them to a point where we don't have to worry about them anymore because they can just get on and become doctors and nurses and teachers and all that kind of stuff am i being too cynical so thank you paul so is paul being cynical um in terms of focusing on um sort of deprived young people Mm, it's, it's a really interesting question. I mean, it's not the focus on, it's so, why we focus why, on. Why, yeah, in order to make them. It's the reason behind mm. that the like, I have no problem focusing on anybody, but you know, it's kind of, it's the reasons behind. Mm. I, I mean, 
I would say that if we're looking at achievement, then achievement is um, personalized. It's not necessarily attainment. And I think, um, you know, if we're only looking at trying to um, make this impossible gap smaller, um, because by definition it's built in, um, then it, nothing's going to happen there. But if we're talking about achievement for all people, because this is where social justice fits in, then it's not only um, those pupils who are seen as, um, you know, coming or being um, deprived of inverted commas in, in some way or another. And it's around enabling all learners to have that sense of achievement, it goes on to promote um, you know, sort of well-being and, and so on. And a, a sense of self, self-value was very much what we were looking at, as well as just the attainment, but it was about how you feel about yourself. Um, so I, I don't know if you want to add anything, but I, I, I've also realised that my, I hadn't been, my um, chat hadn't been updating, and I realised that there'd been one or two other chats that I hadn't seen, so I do apologise for that. Um, one in particular was interesting about you know, so why are we dealing with um, student teachers and space is because space is about learning and it's not only physical space, it's it's the cognitive and the social space. And all of those are about the quality of learning and the deep the, the deepening of learning, which I, I you know, which I feel is an important part of initial teacher education. Um, uh, that was from, um, I think to everyone, um, yes, yeah, so short time in ITE, better spent on pedagogy. That it, but it is better spent on pe pedagogy, curriculum, and assessment. Basically, it's all about pedagogy and curriculum, um, really, in, in, in its own sense. Um, I'm just trying to catch up now on. Um, can these innovations persist in the presence of testing in primary schools? Oof. I think. Sorry. Sorry. I don't, sorry, I caught my camera off because I, I look hideous at the end of the day and it says Chris Wolf because that's my husband's Zoom account. But this oh. is. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, I was just having a wee think there about um, the shared learning spaces and that kind of ethos or uh, philosophy around the learning environment for the children. And it's something that we're doing as our school just now, we're looking at asking the children in terms of mapping the environment, what does learning look like to them from their perspective and how does it feel to them? And how do we use the outdoors and the indoors and the shared spaces indoors as well? Um, and I'm really interested in that kind of deep learning philosophy around sort of Fullen's work around um, engage the world, change the world and those sort of system changes. Mm -hmm. Really interested in that presentation and I think it's actually something that can relate later on. We're um, Argyll and Butte so we do a lot of work um, with, we, we're in Helensborough so our school's quite large compared to some of the more rural schools um, and we have um, like lost primary in our cluster that has 10 children and I've got about 300 children in my school so it's quite interesting to work together in terms of how the the pandemic has hit us and how how we've coped with that and um, the inequalities around that as well where rural schools sort of got to bring all their children back whilst we still had to struggle on um, and some of the more interesting things around um, how much money there is for the, the funding that the government puts out for summer activities um, and what we're doing just now as a piece of work is um, what what children should be entitled to that in terms of the criteria the government sets out, um, who to include and who to exclude, and that includes when we're looking at ASN children, the children who have siblings where one child can go but the others can't, mm -hmm. um, and an interesting conversation with colleagues around, you know, if I've only got 10 children in my school and five of them or eight of them are selected through the criteria, what detail yeah. two or three or whatever um, yeah. in my school that's obviously markedly different so I'm just mm -hmm. very interested in both presentations yeah. and how they come together with some of the work we're doing just now well th thank you for um 
thank you for that. And, um, you know, it, it's good to connect. This is what these little sessions are all about. And obviously on the time available, we can never have in-depth conversations. I also know how difficult it is on Zoom and so on, or Teams, whatever it is that we're on, I don't know, um, to actually have um, genuine dialogue. But I know that certainly from both, uh, both teams, both from Mark and uh, his team and from our team, we are only too delighted to engage in further conversation and discussion and just like to thank you all very very much indeed for giving up your time and giving us a chance to um, articulate some of our um, our work and share it with you it's been really really helpful um, so thank you again um, I think I have a final slide um, to show uh, which is as we all leave is uh, as it is there I hope you can see it um, that uh, obviously if you want to uh, also connect with CIRA then clearly there are huge benefits to do so. So can I thank the organisers of uh, the CIRA Connect, can I thank you all